Thanks for tuning in. I'm Sarah Kenna from Company Matters, Link Group's Company Secretarial and Corporate Governance Team. This is the inaugural episode of our In Conversation With series. We intend to get under the skin of all things Company Secretarial. To kick things off, Michael Conway, Associate Director at Company Matters, spoke with two distinguished guests about the role of the company secretary from a non-executive director's perspective. The guests were Louis Cooper, CEO of the Non-Executive Directors Association, and Liz McMeekin, Senior Independent Director and Remuneration Committee Chair at Unite Group PLC, Remuneration Committee Chair at McBride, and ESG Committee Chair at Delata Hotel Group PLC. Lots of experience, lots of interesting chat. I hope you enjoy. So um, I thought we'd start off rather predictably and um, perhaps um, never to be talking about virtual meetings. Um, certainly, um, there's a general feedback from our clients that uh, they're delighted to return to physical meetings. Um, what, what, what's your view? And do you think there's a, a place for virtual meetings in the future going forward? Well, um, it is a very, very topical matter still, I think. Everybody was delighted to get back together. There's no doubt about that. And uh, physical meetings bring uh, an ability to read your colleagues far better. You get more out of the meeting. You can see the mood music. You can determine the mood music far better in that meeting. You have the opportunity, you know, in a coffee break to catch up with people that you simply can't do on a virtual meeting. So it it brings people together and, and, and we're naturally social people. So inevitably, I think there was a real euphoria about getting together. Virtual meetings, it's very interesting. I think there is quite a push, for example, for committee meetings to be held um, virtually, uh, particularly if they're not held on the same day as the board meeting. Um, And I was a great exponent of that. In fact, when we spoke, we've spoken before, and I, I said, oh, I thought actually committee meetings, great. I've actually got to a stage now, if you are the only one who is not virtual, it is very, very difficult, I think, to be in any form of a meeting. Um, So perhaps the adage that either everybody's virtual and we operate that way or everybody's physically in attendance, but the hybrid meeting, I think, is very difficult to chair. It's difficult to participate in, uh, in the sense that, you know, those in the room tend to forget those on the screen. And, and being on the screen, one feels a bit left out. And then finally, I, 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 I have had coronavirus, I had COVID, and I joined a two-day strategy meeting virtually. I was the only non-physically non-physic- present participant. And I look back on that, and I think that was a, a, an error. I really couldn't participate properly. So I think there's a place for them, but I think you have to be careful how they're managed. Um, and there are those now who are saying virtual meetings work when everybody, even those in the room, if they're going to have to have a hybrid meeting, have their own screen in front of them so that when they're speaking, those who are um, distant can actually see the expression of the person who's speaking and determine who it is as well. Yep. I mean, I think our experience is that the technology isn't good enough to allow for a hybrid board meeting. And certainly as a company secretary, if you're not in the room, it's it's virtually impossible to sort of follow follow the conversation and uh, understand who's talking, and you quite often just hear spoons in coffee cups being stirred rather than the conversation. So I think it is a at the moment certainly an all or nothing approach. But do you, but do you think we'll see some board meetings being held virtually as a matter of course, you know, particularly during some periods of bad weather or if people have got a long long way to travel. I think certainly, well, this week, for example, with the rail strikes, we've gone to a completely virtual board committee meeting tomorrow. I think your point around travel is really well made. Um, One of the boards I sit on has a very international flavour to its its board members, and they have decided that they are going to have a number of board meetings um, physically present, but about a third of them will be exclusively virtual. And that is for a cost saving. Um, It's the it's the sort of meetings where you're not discussing strategy, perhaps they are more the routine matters that would typically be looked at, you know, performance measures, those sort of things. I do think there is a place for virtual meetings, but it has to be well managed. And I think one's ability to chair those meetings is, it's a, it's a different art. People who are brilliant at chairing a physical meeting don't necessarily 
uh, chair a virtual meeting as well. Some do, but not all. Thanks, Liz. I can change the subject a bit and just talk about provision of information to directors, and it's a subject that's close to the heart of every company secretary. But I think um, it, it's a con fairly constant theme that we, we see come up in board evaluations. Uh, and the question is, you know, is there too much information, too little, and do you get it on time? So really, um, that's that's a question to Lou, and then, then maybe Liz would be interested to get your perspective as well. Thanks, Michael. Some of this ties into the previous comments as well on virtual meetings, because I think we found with some of the board reviews we've been doing recently that the information flows have have been different in terms of some of the volume of information has been trimmed, which I think a lot of people complained about in the past in terms of the actual volume of information that you need to consider uh, before, during and, and after meetings. Um, so I think that's a, a bit of a change coming through as well. Um, but I think um, the simple ad adage of um, quality of the, the information leads to the quality of the decision making being improved. So I think that sort of equation still holds, um, holds as well. And I think there needs to be some degree of trust in the executive to pull together the right information at the right time um, to enable the board to come to that decision making process. And um, I think it's um, also a, a two way communication. I think. Um, um, there's a lot of information that comes up into the board, but there also needs to be good information coming back out of the process. Um, and I think um, a lot of boards just focus on the provision of information into the board and don't always think about the information that then comes out of it. But I think um, really where boards surprise me in particular is that um, we're still hearing people say, it's too much information and you know, there's, there's overload. And the simple question there is, why don't you just do something about that? Why don't you, you push back and, and make sure that you know, we've got the appropriate information to, uh, to work from? And I think the, um, the chair and the company secretary in particular um, are the key people through that process and should orchestrate the uh, provision of information and should be able to together a pack that um, is, is fit for purpose for the board. So you do need to understand what's required and, um, and not just produce volume for the sake of volume, uh, but think about how you go about your review of the situation that's been presented and make sure that you are able to make the right decisions. And also signposting of that, um, that process as well, so that you make sure that there's good signposting within the, the information that's presented and um, how that uh, is then followed up, particularly with, um, with what comes out of the process. The minutes should really be tied back into the board packs and make sure that um, there's clear uh, linkage between the two. It's really important to make sure there's no disconnect uh, because it's a key element of how boards operate in terms of documentation. You know, if anything goes wrong, first call is for the uh, the minutes but also the paperwork that the board went through uh, to get to the uh, the decisions that were being made I think that the um, the feedback going back to the, the banking crisis the feedback then I think was very much that um, you know there was um, a clear disconnect and um, the, um, the information flows weren't, uh, weren't, weren't working effectively I mean I think certainly you know that we find regulated businesses, businesses in the financial services sector tend to have a lot more paper in their ball packs now than they, they used to and uh, that, that's an increasing trend and um, you know, I certainly think uh, you know, it's part of the job of the company secretary to make sure that it's very clear what the board is expected to be doing with each paper for approval or to be noted um, and uh, we often find that the quality of signposting that that sort of uh, requirement isn't always always clear. Liz, what about your perspective on this? Uh, well, I think Louis made some really good points. I, I'm not in the financial services sector, so I, I nor the sort of the insurance world, so I don't have that overload that you you've just described, Michael. But I have 
uh, I suppose, four things that I would highlight here. One is timeliness of the papers. That matters almost more than anything. Getting the papers too close to the meeting gives you no chance to digest them and reflect on them. And that's more important than absolutely anything, I think. Too much information, I would then suggest it needs to be rejigged into appendices with actually the work going into the body of the paper that you would expect the NEDs for the board to read. And then if they want to look at more detail, they can do so separately. Too little information, I think, isn't good for trust. I think Louis mentioned the word trust. That's absolutely key. Too little information, you begin to ask, wonder why it would be that you're not being fed sufficient. And the provision of minutes, again, timeliness, absolutely critical. Receiving minutes weeks, even sometimes months later, as it simply doesn't allow the sort of review of the minutes, particularly as Louis intimated, if things aren't going right, those minutes are critical. So timeliness, uh, appendices, and I suppose a trust question, if you feel you're not getting enough information, would be my key highlights. And I think we have a pretty strict uh, guidance at the timeliness of minutes and making sure boards have access to action points, you know, within days following the meeting, because that is that is key. I think in terms of timeliness of information, almost every company secretary I suspect that you talk to will will have had their careers plagued by having to chase for papers. One way of dealing with this is really for, for directors of board meetings to actually make the point, because I think uh, how much a company secretary will tell the executive it's important to have these papers out on time. Um, they really need to hear from the directors. And I think that 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 can affect the change. One thing that you, you you both mentioned just now was the word trust. Just talking about some um, about that and really the integrity of the information that you receive. I mean, do you have, have I mean, is that an area of challenge for you? Uh, generally, do you trust the information you get? I I think generally speaking, yes. I mean. I would look for a business that has, you know, in terms of its board culture, the trust would be absolutely, I, I suppose, inclusiveness. You, you get a feeling of, of the mood uh, of, the, of the culture of the board and the trust that engenders. I have worked on boards where that trust has not been uh, at the level it should be at. And that's when things really do start to break down, I think. Um, so trust is a fundamental barometer of how healthy the business is and the board is, um, it's, it's absolutely critical. Um, I would say 90% of the time, um, if not higher, 95% of the time, the trust is there. And the board effectiveness process, of course, is a great, a great way of raising issues that, that might need raising. Um, and you've got the chair and you've got the SID, if the chair is part of that problem. Uh, so there are various mechanisms to addressing, um, you know, if there is a concern around trust. But I would say in, in, in most businesses that are performing reasonably well or very well, it's not an issue. It tends to be in businesses where there is a crisis of some, dis uh, of some description. Not always, but sometimes. Louis, I don't know if you've got anything to add there. Yes, I think it's the points that um, this is uh, outlined. And I think um, a lot of this comes back to the three so the key roles in terms of the chair who runs the board, the CEO who runs the, the organisation day to day, and so should be marshalling the um, uh, the papers that flow into the board. But obviously the company secretary as well, in terms of really pulling everything together and working with both the chair and, and the CEO to to make sure that the um, appropriate papers are. Are there, and as very much as Liz has been saying earlier on, you know that that, uh, that timeline. It's, it's important to uh, to make sure that's followed through. Um, I think also the directors are over the last couple of years with the Section One Seven Two requirements, very much looking at um, the ability to focus on the success of the company, and um, you know part of that should be uh, how they go about their decision making and make sure they've got the right information to make those those key decisions. So I think that's um, led to a bit of a focus of attention in terms of the, the directors and their duties uh, to be followed through. Um, and I think um, it is very much coming together as a team. So you are working together as a team. So you should be 
trusting of other members of your team. I've just been working with the board um, last week. We were talking through development of the board. And one thing they hadn't really focused on was the sort of teamwork element. And I think the, the COVID situation in particular um, hasn't helped in terms of how boards have been coming together and working together. I think in the past, there has been more social interaction that may take place before or after the meetings and allow people to talk outside of the, the mainstream um, activities of the board. It is developing that sort of culture of behaviours within the boardroom itself uh, that really helps to, uh, to make sure that people are on the same page. And I think also um, one point that um, I just wanted to make in terms of virtual meetings as well, going back to what we said at the beginning, um, the ability to go into the office, meet in the office and meet other people and to, um, to interact with, um, with executives and other people working day to day in the organisation is, is fairly critical. I think that, again, has been missing over this um, pandemic over the last couple of years. And that can actually help to make sure that um, NEDs in particular um, are engaging with the executive team. And perhaps if they don't, if they want some more information, um, you know, they, they've got the ability to perhaps dip into the office now and again and, uh, and have a conversation with people just to follow set things up, which um, I think has been quite tricky, um, as I said, over the last few years. So you, I mean, you also mentioned um, just now Section 172, and I think thinking about uh, the content of wallpapers. Um, I think it's important that um, directors are uh, able to take some comfort from the wallpapers that their, their Section 172 duties generally have been addressed and are covered. And I think that's that's an important point as well. L Liz, you, you mentioned the value of the board effectiveness, effectiveness evaluation. What, what, if we turn to that for the moment, for a moment, um, I mean, what do you see the, um, the role of the company secretary to be in that, in that process, Liz? I think the company secretary is pivotally important in the board effectiveness process. I would say um, probably second only to the chair of the board. And I think they, they need to pivot, if you like, because um, often they have other roles as well as the, uh, the role of company secretary, maybe the legal counsel. But this is very much a role where discretion um, and um, confidentiality are, are really key. I see their role as being there from the very genesis of the board effectiveness decision. You know, is it going to be internal, external? Um, if it's external, who's the provider going to be being there with the chair as they determine whom they're going to use? I think as the information starts to flow back, as the process is in hand, they will see information, very confidential information that will be about the chair, but it will also be about individual board members, committees, and needs to be handled sensitively and discreetly. And then I think how it's presented back to the board, they will have often a role in. And also the follow through on that. I think I've seen hugely valuable board effectiveness processes take place. And often a lot of the value is in actually disseminating the information agreeing how it's going, what, what's the so what, so what's going to happen with it, and actually managing that process. So I see them as, um, as, as absolutely pivotal in, uh, in, the, in the whole board effectiveness process, particularly, as I said, where it's an external provider. Certainly quite often we see an evaluation take place, lots of good things said at a meeting, and then it's sort of put on the back burner for another year. And, and, and Louis, from your point of view, the thing with the uh, board effectiveness is that there isn't a, an approach that you sort of just pick off the shelf. It is very much tailoring to your requirements. So I think the company secretary can really help with that in terms of um, you know, what will work for our board in particular. I think as Liz outlined, it's working with the chair uh, to get the best approach and um, to make sure that you just don't sort of have a, a questionnaire that you've been using a number of years and keep rolling out the same process. It is thinking about what will work for the organisation. And I think you have various options. People tend to start with something internal. They can then move to a, an internal plus a, bring somebody in to, uh, to have a look at what you've been doing or a full external uh, process. Um, so I think there are various options. And I think the company secretary can, 
can help with that uh, um, understanding of what will work. And sometimes there, is, sometimes there also needs to be a bit of a selling activity in terms of selling the need to do this. I think a number of organisations are still working their way through what um, is the best way of undertaking this type of exercise. Because, as Liz said, it, it can be quite confidential data and information that you're dealing with. And you're dealing with egos and people at a senior level. So you do need to uh, to manage that process. And I think the company secretary will know the culture and the, and the people involved and will know how best perhaps to, to pitch things and to take it forward. One thing we're also we're doing some work around it, um, because we do undertake a number of board uh, reviews of this nature, is do you need an effectiveness review or do you need a performance review? Because I think those words are used and not always understood in terms of what difference might be because effectiveness is just looking at the mechanics of how the board operates it's used as a term by the regulators that talk about uh, board effectiveness but they also then slip into board performance and if you're if you're doing a board performance review you do need to set objectives and individuals in the board need to have objectives in which case they need to have something that can be measured um, you, know, you can't do a performance review if you've got nothing to, to measure against and if you go into a lot of boards and ask to see their, their objectives, you may get a bit of a blank look back in terms of um, what's been uh, agreed and prepared. So again, I think those differentials are, are key to understand what you're looking to achieve and what you're looking to get out of this process. And I think um, you're right, you do need to make sure that it's followed through. And quite often, we're now looking at uh, leading it into a board development type program we've just been working with someone in this area in particular where the board saw this as the stepping stone to understand better what they need in terms of board development um, and I think it also leads into things like succession plans and other other elements so I think it's it's important just to set the the uh, the parameters and understand you know what you're seeking to, to get out of this um, exercise and I think as I said at the beginning the company secretary is key to help to bring all that together and work very closely with the chair to uh, to make sure it works effectively. This was an area where there was quite a lot of resistance some years ago to the whole concept of an evaluation. Certainly, I think our experience over the last two or three years, probably since the introduction of the, the, the new code, the 2018 code, has been that boards have accepted the value and the benefit of it a lot more willingly than, 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 than they did. And, um, you know, I think it's an area for, that will continue to develop. I don't think any conversation these days is complete without discussing ESG. Maybe, Louis, to start with, I mean, do, do you think directors, non-executives in particular, are equipped to deal with, you know, the, the various challenges of ESG and probably climate change in particular? Yes, it's certainly a hot topic. And I think it's used as a term now that I think most people will be thinking about the E rather than the S and G when they, they use the term. So I think it's important to, to understand what it does mean for you and how it then breaks down to the key elements. Because I think the G has always been the domain of the, the NED in particular as the sort of the guardian of good governance, but also the company secretary in terms of uh, a lot of the mechanics of what goes on in that area in particular. Um, and the S has been the, the domain of, of HR and, and people side. And I think the E bits has um, really been the, the, the key driver more recently. And that's where I think a lot of boards um, are struggling in terms of what's our response and how do we make sure we've got the right plans in place and we've got the right understanding of what it means for us. And I think um, that's where a lot of directors, MEDs in particular, feel perhaps that they, um, they really need to understand what um, they need to do. And I think um, there, there is a lot of help out there, but I think just I was just reading this morning that there's a concern that a lot of this is, is vague and meaningless because, um, you know, what um, what does do environmental issues mean if you're not a, perhaps an oil and gas company and resources company where you're sort of dealing with the environment day to day? But if you're in an office environment, you know, what is the key focus of attention? And a lot of the emphasis so far has been on data collecting data, reporting data, it should come back to an understanding of what it means from a strategic point of view. So how does it 
determine with your strategy. Um, what are the risks that you face? What are the, risks, the threats and the opportunities that you need to, to deal with? Um, so if it's finding its way into those, those areas, then I think boards are more engaged in, um, about how that uh, works. And I think the question is, um, you know, where do we need help? Um, and I think some boards are really moving towards setting up sort of subcommittees of the board in particular in some of these areas, particularly sort of re, perhaps rebadging it towards the sustainability um, side of things. But I think the key thing with this is you just need to be careful that you don't start a, another sort of cottage industry on the side because it's probably a risk in terms of the organisation. So do include it within your overall sort of risk framework. It is strategic, so do think about it in terms of the overall strategy. So I think there's a bit of a, work, a caution in terms of what you're doing to um, deal with this area in particular. And I think the investment community initially, when this really gained some momentum, were looking at the company response to meet the E, the S and the G sort of areas. And it's really having a clear message uh, to, uh, to present what you're doing in that area. I think going back to the company secretary, they can, again, help with, resonating what that actually means to the organisation and help to really differentiate the wood from the trees in terms of what's our plan of action, what do we need to do to make sure that we're, we're on the front foot with this rather than um, being on the back foot and not really appreciating the scale of the issue. So I think there's some degree of understanding of the materiality of what, um, you know, what we need to cover. Absolutely. Um, Liz, Louis mentioned fact that some companies are setting up ESG committees and in fact you you chair one at one of your companies so really interested to hear your your perspective and also you know what what is the future of ESG against the current you know difficult economic background possibility of a recession um, that we're currently facing yes uh, I do chair an ESG committee and I, I describe it as a pioneering territory uh, as a non-executive director because unlike an audit committee or an anoms committee or a REM committee, there is no prescribed way almost of doing it. And I'm confident that many ESG committees have quite a different hue, the one from the other. Uh, and I have to say that in the particular case of the ESG committee I chair, the company secretary has been enormously helpful and involved in helping to set it up, um, particularly around terms of reference. That's been a long and iterative process, a very important process, actually, to get right. It's taken us probably the best part of 12, 15 months to do that. I mean, we haven't stopped operating as a committee, but it, it's, it's, we've had to keep uh, iterating back and looking at, well, what's working and what isn't working. So the company secretary has uh, had a very important role to play there and, and also in determining the agenda, my particular method of working tends to be that I will liaise often with the company secretary on if it's a REMCO or an ESG meeting, committee meeting. Um, I think that's a, a really helpful way to chew the cud on what needs to be on the agenda for that meeting. I think also another aspect of the COSEC where they can really help is particularly as this becomes more data driven and the data needs verification and the verification will often happen within the finance function even if it's not strictly speaking financial data but it will be audited very soon it will need to be verified and actually that link that sort of joined up thinking between board committees equally if there's a health and safety committee how does the health and safety committee dovetail with the ESG committee because there is a there's a read across certain certain certainly in certain companies um, there is uh, and also in remuneration terms as more and more companies are targeting their executives with ESG data again the COSEC is a constant through all of those committees you may or may not have members on all committees sitting on you know on the ESG committee um, but they are a constant and then a very important element in, in ensuring that thinking is joined up and, and works. In terms of your very interesting and frankly quite challenging question around the finances and how it impacts on ESG, I think many companies now have started to um, render the sustainability element as completely integral to their overall strategy. So the fact that we are 
probably sailing into a recession. Uh, times are certainly difficult with hyperinflation, or with very high levels rather of inflation. Um, I don't think we've seen that play out yet, at least I've not, where people have said, well, we can't afford to do that now. Um, obviously, uh, ensuring value for money is critical um, at, at every stage of the game. Um, in terms of the S element, actually, the social element, funnily enough, I see that playing out more obviously in um, sectors such as hospitality, where actually trying to get hold of people to do perform the roles within the hospitality sector is becoming increasingly difficult. And I think almost without knowing it, there is a huge focus on the S at the moment. I, I think a lot of companies do some wonderful things, but they don't communicate them perhaps as well as they might to the stakeholders. But the S, I think it's having perversely the, the, the opposite impact. It's so difficult to find people to work in restaurants, hotels, manning the, you know, the front desk of, a, of anything, any sort of public facing, customer facing uh, entity that uh, businesses have had to become much more focused on actually how do we attract good people to our organization and how do we retain them when we do. So um, I, I, I think it's early days on the sustainability front. It would be incredibly disappointing to find that people walk away from the S because we have targets to hit that are vitally important uh, around climate change um, and, and we need to be ingenious in how we 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 get those targets met. And the S, I think, is actually being focused on to a far greater degree, precisely because of these very difficult um, economic times that we face. I think you make an interesting point, is making sure that the work of the various board committees are integrated, and not duplicated. And I suppose that's been a challenge there in other respects for, for some years, but I think this has brought it into sharp focus, sure. As we draw to a close, can I look forward a bit really it's about the increase in regulation we've recently seen the government response to the um, recent consultation on audit reform and, and corporate governance reform that is unlikely to be introduced much before 2024 any changes are likely to be introduced in, in about 2024 from 2024 and and th those changes will be quite su substantial and wide-ranging certainly will increase the responsibilities and the work of non-executive directors, um, the work of the audit committee, and inevitably the work of the company secretary. L Louis, I mean, these are big challenges for, for, for NEDS. And do, do you think it will, it will impact the number of people willing to be non-executive directors going forward? That's a really good point. I think, um, as you say, it's, uh, it's still going to um, follow through. I think, um, obviously, the consultation paper the response to the consultation has only just been published a week or two ago, um, and there's quite a lot in there. Um, I think um, we run an, a lot of training and education as part of our non-executive directors association activities, and uh, we haven't seen a real change in the numbers. We've actually seen more people coming on to, to, um, to training and education sessions because people have been going through the pandemic are looking at um, their own sort of career pros prospects and thinking about their own sort of work-life balance. Um, we've seen a number of people start to think about taking on uh, NED roles, but I think you're making a really good point in terms of changes that are coming down the track. And I think it's getting to really understand this area because there's so much there. I think if you look at the response to a consultation in particular, quite a lot of detail to work through. And a lot of this is framed, I think, with the new regulator taking over as well, with the the, um, the audits, reporting and governance authority, ARGA, taking over from the FRC. And I think they've been gearing up in terms of the numbers of people in that organisation that um, they're really going to um, look more co closely at how companies operate in terms of the director's role, corporate reporting, um, some of the committee activities, and obviously then that links into the audit side as well. Um, but I think um, what we feel as an organisation is that boards generally need to take more ownership of their, their CPD, their continuing professional development, to make sure they're up to speed with a lot of this information. And currently there's no one really tasked with that activity 
Um, but I think that's a, a good area for the, the company secretary in particular to support the board in terms of individual development, but also team development and board development generally, and making sure that individual directors are fit for purpose and really understanding of the requirements that are coming through. Um, so I think there's a good opportunity for the company secretary to really push that forward. I know a lot of, a lot of good company secretaries already do that in terms of making sure that their boards are kept up to date and they run various updates and sessions to make sure that they they um, really work, in, work hard to, to, to bring this area together. Um, but I think it's such a diverse range of things that you need to keep up to date with. There's no central point that you can go to because it's coming from all directions. And I think it's important just to, to make sure that you um, do think about your own development and you take control of that, take that forward. And I think um, you know some of the new reporting coming through in terms of the resilience side, the audit and assurance policy requirements that are coming through, then I think it's really how you report this information and put this information across that's going to, to be important. And the linkage into some of these other areas, uh, as we've been discussing through the uh, the conversation uh, today. Certainly, I think. Um, I mean, directors do have a responsibility to keep themselves up to date and understand their regulatory responsibilities. You know, company secretaries should be, if they're not already doing, uh, facilitate that process. Um, Liz, from your your perspective, is there any more that company secretaries can do to help here? I have to say that my experience has been very good in terms of company secretaries helping on, on board training, um, increasingly so actually of late, where a number of boards and one board actually dedicates an entire day a year to training and all the board is invited to give input uh, to the company secretary who, who leads that day um, and finds speakers um, and, and brings the whole thing together. Other boards, um, similarly, maybe on more technical issues that the COSEC will bring, you know, people in. It might be at the end of a board meeting, it might not be dedicated to a whole day. It might be half a day. I've had half a day uh, board meetings, uh, training meetings too. Um, so I think there is a real role to be played there, and particularly given the discussion that has just taken place around what sound to be quite significant changes in roles and in responsibilities. I think a COSEC can, can really help distill that and, and, and point the non-execs in the right way. I, I heard Louis say, and, and would agree with him absolutely, that it is the responsibility of each non-executive to ensure that they are up to date. If you're a REMCO chair, for example, I'm a, I chair a couple of REMCOs. I see it as my, my responsibility to keep up to, to date, to know what's going on. Uh, the big four do fantastic non-executive uh, training opportunities. If you're talking about ESG, something like Chapter Zero provides fantastic opportunities to, to understand more about what's going on. And I, I've even seen actually recently um, a non-exec join a board where that was as part of their contract, their service agreement rather, was that they, they undertook that they would regularly keep themselves updated. So I, I think it's a balance between the, the role of the COSEC and the role of the individual non-executive director, but where the training impacts all board members, it can be hugely beneficial to go through it together. Because yeah. you get, I guess, more than twice the value. You know, you get your, your, your own input and your, what you take out of it, but then you hear what your colleagues uh, are thinking at the same time. And of course, you know, the company secretary is, is sort of part of that process that the training will be tailored and focused on what that board needs and, and requires. So I think uh, it is important that the company secretary plays a role here and, and is proactive. Um, so before we be sort of wind up, um, what more can company secretaries do to help non-executive directors? I think um, one of the things that, they, and it sounds, it sounds rather prosaic, but management of time. And, and we've talked about timeliness of board papers arriving. We've talked about timeliness of, of draft minutes being issued. Um, timeliness of the calendar, the board calendar. I think, uh, you know, it must be an absolute nightmare to manage the, the, the calendar of board meetings, uh, committee meetings. But 
having those in the diary and a regular cadence and rhythm and looking out even two years and reminding the board regularly, even every board, you know, as an appendix to the, at the end of every board meeting is hugely valuable because that management of time can be extremely frustrating as a non-exec when things keep getting changed because perhaps they weren't thought through enough in the first place. That's hugely frustrating. And I think as well, just looking at, um, you know, where there are big decisions being made by boards, um, involvement of the company secretary there around the right order in which things are done, signposting to the board what's happening, um, ensuring that the papers follow suit, that the right minutes are, you know, sometimes they're quite formulaic minutes, that they're all there well in advance. So I think for me, my, my plea would be around timeliness. That's interesting to hear that, it's because they're the sorts of things that, you know, I think a good company secretary would would say was important as well. That's, that's interesting. Um, Louis? Um, I think the, the company secretary can just make sure that, that all these things happen. We touched upon a whole range of different topics and key areas for our conversation. I think if the company secretary can actually make sure that um, the board evaluations, the papers, succession planning plans, um, all these things need to happen. And I, I agree with, um, with Liz in terms of the, the efficiency of that uh, approach. Um, but making sure it's it's really um, it for the purpose of the organisation, so it ties into how the organisation ticks. So they'll, they'll understand the board and how the board thinks. Um, and I think also um, helping at each end of the process in terms of um, things like induction and bring people onto the board itself um, is, is really down to the chair. But the chair working with the company secretary can make sure that people are inducted appropriately. And there could be an element of mentoring and just helping them to uh, slot in with the board and to understand how the board uh, actually ticks. So I think it's quite a pivotal role. Um, one um, example uh, recently that we've been to an organisation on the back of their, their board review, they felt that they actually needed to move the person who's the company secretary to more of a board secretary in terms of the style and the way that they operated. So it's quite interesting just seeing that sort of differential in terms of how the role may be interpreted and um, the, the way that they need to interact with boards and uh, board members in particular. So I think, um, you know, there's a lot of uh, support that can be provided. There's lots of change going on and it's really helping navigate that change and deal with that change going forward. Yeah, I think certainly amongst some very large companies, we see the concept of, you know, a board secretary or board dedicated sort of function. So maybe that's some, some, something we'll see develop in the future. Um, Liz and Louis, thank you so much for your time this morning. It's been really interesting talking to you um, outside the board, boardroom and um, being able to sort of um, hear your views on some of these subjects. So thank you. Thank you so much. And that concludes today's conversation. Thanks again to Michael, Louis and Liz for taking the time to chat. If you found this conversation interesting, you can subscribe on whatever platform you're listening to us on. That way, you won't miss an upload. Thanks again for listening.